verses 2 to 13. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they all were alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had, they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray for Mike. Father God, we just thank you for Mike, Lord. Thank you for the word that you've placed in his heart, Father. And we thank you for your word, for the way that it speaks to us today. And Lord, we just trust you this morning that we would hear your voice. And Lord, that you would speak to us here this morning. Amen. 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 Morning, church. How are you doing? It's good to see you all. Um, Mick said earlier about we can be together as God's people even if we don't understand what's going on. So I feel like that's a prophetic word as we come to uh, the gospel this morning. Um, so <laughs> hopefully not. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get somewhere close to understanding uh, before the end, uh, God willing. Uh, it's good to see you. I, I love God's word. Um, it's, scripture was once described as being like a, a river in that it's shallow enough for a child to paddle in but deep enough for an elephant to swim. Uh, I think that's so true. I had a conversation just this week with someone where, where this came up, the fact that however much you know or think you know scripture, it always has a way to say something more to you. You can go back to a story that you've read a thousand times or a book that you've read a thousand times and God say something completely new or open your eyes to something that you've not noticed before. It really is a living and breathing book. Hopefully you found that as we've travelled and trekked through the largely familiar ground of, of Mark's Gospel. Uh, I know I've had many, many revelation moments uh, as we've explored the text together. That's certainly been true this week. As I've prayed and, and, and prepared for today, it's been a real time of grappling and, and wrestling with the text. It's not been the, the easiest sermon to write this week, if I'm honest, but, but perhaps not for the reasons you might think. Because actually... What is true of Scripture is even more true of Jesus. Uh, and this week, as I've reflected, prayed, and, and sat in the truth of the Transfiguration, I've been awestruck by the beauty, power, and majesty uh, of the God that we gather to worship together. I've been reminded of the infinite and inexhaustible glory of Jesus. Uh, and when you spend time sitting in that reality of who Jesus is, it's hard to find any words after to do it justice. Certainly words that fit into a 20-minute sermon. So the struggle was not, what could I possibly say about this text, but more which of the, the 50 sermons was the right one for us today. It's been a week where I've been reminded constantly that I and we often need a bigger vision of who Jesus is. I love the way John ends his gospel by saying, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And that's certainly the feeling I've had as I've been awestruck by Jesus this week, that we need a bigger vision of who Jesus is. And perhaps it's in moments like that that these texts like the Transfiguration help us as Jesus explodes beyond what we can imagine, what we can measure or comprehend or, or rationalise. And the Transfiguration is, is central to the gospel accounts. In Matthew, Mark and Luke, it's a, a turning point in the narrative. It literally comes right in the centre of Mark's gospel. 
It's an important moment, but it's often a story, uh, if we're honest, that in the West we could be accused of glossing over or, or not teaching at all. It doesn't take much working out why we might avoid this one, does it? It's a, it's a little bit weird, right? Um, if you don't think it's weird, you've been a Christian for a long time. Um, <laughs> I was thinking this week, it feels like to me one of those moments I remember when, when, uh, when I wasn't a pastor and you'd be inviting a friend to come along to church and they'd finally come along and you'd think, well, we're in Mark's Gospel, it's fairly safe, nothing weird's going to happen, is it? Um, and the next minute you have Jesus going up a mountain with his three friends meeting two long dead prophets, there's a talking cloud and, and Jesus all the while is glowing in the dark. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a normal everyday thing. Even the word transfiguration is weird, right? I mean, has anyone, I'm interested, feel free to, to tell me if I'm wrong, but has anyone used that word in the last 12 months in any other context than talking about Jesus? Maybe that can be your homework this week. Um, see, if you can, see if you can slot it in somewhere. But when we skip over this story, we miss something really stunning about who Jesus is. So I think we need to embrace the weirdness of our faith, the otherworldliness of our faith. We need to embrace the transfiguration and what it tells us about who Jesus is. Importantly, this all comes off the back of an event. Uh, this whole event comes off the back of Peter's declaration last week that Jesus is the Messiah. That's really important. And if you remember, immediately after that, Jesus begins to show what that looks like, how it's so different uh, to the expectations of God's people. And for the first time, Jesus predicted his own death, and then he then teaches on the cost of discipleship and the way of the cross. And then we have perhaps one of the most contested verses in Mark's Gospel, when Jesus says in, verse, in the first verse of chapter 9, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with, with power. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. So what's that all about? What does Jesus mean by that? Well, as always in Christian theology, there's a number of theories. Uh, one of those is that Jesus is talking about his second coming. I mean, that's often what springs to mind when we think about the kingdom of God coming in power. Jesus returning at the end of time to bring the day of salvation and judgment. But then there's an obvious problem with that interpretation, because if Jesus was talking about the second coming, he was wrong. It's been 2,000 years. No one listening to those words at the time is still alive today. If that's what Jesus was talking about, then he was a false teacher. Others say that Jesus is talking about the resurrection or the ascension or Pentecost or the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, and perhaps there's something in each of those theories. But for me, my best interpretation of what Jesus is referring to, at least in the first instance, is the events that we read about this morning, the transfiguration. Firstly, verse 2 begins uh, after six days, after six days. In other words, six days after Jesus made that prophetic prediction, this then happens. Mark is linking the transfiguration with that prediction six days earlier. Secondly, Jesus' prediction was that some of you would not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And here in verse 2, we see that Jesus only takes the inner circle of his inner circle to witness the events that took place on the mountaintop. Not all the disciples were there. Peter, James, and John were the chosen few. So I think that prediction of Jesus is pointing to the transfiguration and the importance of what the transfiguration is revealing to us, at least in the first instance. Because as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, we get this break in the narrative, break in the journey. Jesus makes a mountaintop detour with that inner circle of his closest friends. And the text says that he was transfigured before them. The word transfigured comes from the Greek word from which we also get the English term metamorphosis. It, it, so it, you get that sense it means physical transformation, a transformation that is visible to others. Mark says that his clothes became whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. I love that. I love the way that Mark describes that. It sort of reminded me this week of those adverts for, for Daz back in the 90s. Uh, anyone remember? Is Daz still around? I don't know. It might, it might be. Uh, shows uh, maybe I don't do enough washing. You know. <laughs> but the point is that there is physical change, and it's beyond anything that can be humanly explained. This is not a trick of the light. It is otherworldly. Heavenly beings are often depicted in scripture as wearing these bright, dazzling white clothes. The, the description of dazzling white clothes uh, and robes is a similar description to Jesus after his resurrection as well. Light is shining from Jesus, which is powerful, 
particularly when you read it in the context of Psalm 104, which says that God wraps himself in light as with a garment. And here Jesus is wrapped in dazzling light. The divine nature of Jesus is being revealed to the three disciples. The three disciples who've got to know Jesus in, in his humanity and have had glimpses of his divinity now get to see Jesus for all that he is in his divine glory. Not a glimpse, but a full window. It's awesome, and that is the right word for it. When we read this alongside the other gospel accounts, we, we get even more detail. Luke tells us that not only did light pour forth from his clothes, but his face changed. Matthew tells us that Jesus' face shone like the sun. And that's really important because anyone remember where we have a, a mountaintop story where someone else's face ends up shining? Moses, right? Yeah, great. Well done. <laughs> Moses in Exodus. He has an encounter with God which makes his face shine, reflecting the light of God. Moses is physically altered by an encounter with God. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but, but I've seen that in people. People who come to faith or, or they have an experience of the Holy Spirit or after baptism, and you can't quite put your finger on it, but it's as if they're physically different somehow. It's like they're shining. Uh, they're the same, but, but different. When, we're in, when we encounter God, we're changed in, in many ways. And so the transfiguration of Jesus is kind of like an echo of that Moses moment on the mountaintop. But it's also different. Because whereas with Moses, he reflected the light of the glory of God. In the transfiguration, Jesus' face isn't reflecting divine light. It is the source of that divine light. Jesus doesn't just reflect the glory of God. He is the very glory of God. That's why Paul can say in Colossians 2.9, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. We sang in our worship this morning, God's hidden glory in creation now revealed in you, our Christ. The hidden glory of, of God revealed in Jesus. And if all that wasn't powerful enough, or evidence enough of who Jesus is, later we have this appearance of a, of a cloud. And again, appearance of powerful clouds is, is loaded in Old Testament imagery of, of the power of God showing up. And then a voice from the cloud, the voice of the Father says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. God the Father says to the disciples, you see who Jesus is now. You want to be obedient to me, be obedient to him. You want to see me, look to Jesus. The God you long for is right in front of you, so listen to him. Only two times in the Gospels do we have the recorded, the audible voice of God the Father. At Jesus' baptism, if you can remember back to Mark chapter 1, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And then here at the Transfiguration. The first time the voice marks the start of Jesus' public ministry and here it begins the next and final phase of it as Jesus sets his eyes to the cross and begins that journey to Jerusalem. <coughs> as well as all that, that visible glory. I missed that one. We also have uh, two Old Testament characters showing up, Moses and Elijah. I was thinking this week, I'd love to know what the conversation they were having was. Um, <laughs> Maybe they were offering words of encouragement to Jesus or vice versa, I don't know. I love that, I love that Moses was there. Right? 1,500 years-ish earlier in Exodus 33, Moses had asked God to show him his glory on a mountaintop. And here on this mountaintop, 1,500 years later, God continues to answer Moses' prayer. If that's not evidence that God's timing is not our own, I, I don't know what is. But why Moses and Elijah? Why at this moment of Jesus revealing his divine, divinity and glory do Moses and Elijah of all people show up? Well, some point to Moses as representing the law and Elijah the prophets. And the, the law and the prophets are, are both pointing towards and are fulfilled by Jesus. So this is a, a powerful sign, if you like, of, of that move from old covenant to new. And maybe that's partially true. But also both Moses and Elijah, as, as we've already uh, glimpsed at had powerful mountaintop encounters with God and both these figures were also linked with end time predictions in the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament the prophet Malachi says that Elijah will return before the great day of God's judgment as Jesus' disciples come down from the mountain they have a discussion about that um, why do people say that Elijah must come first and Jesus' response suggests or points to the fact that this has already been fulfilled and by John the Baptist who mirrored Elijah's ministry in terms of both its prophetic call to repentance but also in the rejection and ill treatment that both Elijah and John the Baptist received. 
in Deuteronomy 18, God says through Moses, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. You must listen to him. Notice that echo of a command to listen to this new Moses when he comes. He's saying all that you've been waiting for, all you've been longing and yearning for, all the fulfillment your heart longs for is found in Jesus. The purposes of God to redeem all of creation is happening in and through Jesus. And Peter, the disciple, bless him, doesn't know what to do with himself. It says he and the others were frozen in fear. They didn't know what to say and who can blame them, really? He offers to make three shelters, one for Jesus, one for Elijah and one for Moses. I feel like it's the equivalent of when someone hears any kind of extreme news, good or bad, and their first reaction is, shall I put the kettle on? Um, not, not knowing what to do, but just wanting to do something. Maybe he wants to make himself useful. Maybe he's trying to be a good Jew and offer good hospitality. Often, Peter gets a bad rap uh, when we talk about the transfiguration. Uh, it's talked about as if he's trying to save this mountaintop experience. He, he's attempting to remain in this glorification of Jesus without having to go back down the mountain and endure the cross. And maybe there's something in that, I'm not sure. But Jesus certainly doesn't rebuke him this time, um, like the last time he suggested that, if that is the case. But whatever this encounter... The, 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 whatever this encounter and whatever Peter's reaction, the main point of the transfiguration is not Moses, it's not Elijah, it's not Peter, it's not us, it's Jesus. Uh, and the text makes that so powerfully obvious. As the clouds lift, the light fades, the disciples are silent. Moses and Elijah are gone once more, and all that is left is Jesus, just Jesus as the one who was just majestically transfigured in all his glory, would now descend the mountain, ready to go to the cross, ready to go from glorification to humiliation. It's powerful. But actually, in the the purposes and plans of God, Jesus' divinity can only be understood in the fuller context of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. It's why Jesus says to his inner circle to keep this encounter quiet until after the cross and the resurrection because you can only understand the divinity and the glory of Jesus fully through the cross you can only understand the full impact of the transfiguration through the crucifixion so listen I don't want to leave you this morning with a a to-do list of things uh, on your spiritual checklists and if that disappoints you if you're the sort of person that needs that or finds that helpful I'm sorry but it's not coming what I, what I want, what my prayer for us is, is that each of us would this morning look afresh at the transfiguration, that it might make us fall on our knees before our Saviour and God Jesus, and that it might encourage us to have an ever-expanding vision of who Jesus is and what that means, both past, present and future. The transfiguration is a peek into the past, eternity past. It's a revelation of Jesus as the one and only Son of God who is preeminent, who existed before the world came to be. It's the full glory of God in human form. It's the king of the universe in the suffering servant. The transfiguration is also a window to help us to interpret the present. Jesus has fulfilled the law and the prophets, and the only way to God is to look to him in faith. In the transfiguration, we see a picture of Jesus' unique and complete authority. And we hear that voice of the Father saying, listen to Jesus. God says the same to us. If you're looking for me, if you're wondering what to do, listen to Jesus. 1 Corinthians says, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. So the transfiguration is a peek into the past, it's a peek into the present, but it's also a peek into the future, when Christ will return in glory and bring to completion the victories already won on the cross, as he ushers in his everlasting kingdom. In the transfiguration, we are given a a preview, a window into what our lives will be like on that final mounting at that second coming when we all will be transfigured, where the transformation that the Holy Spirit has begun in us will be completed in the presence of Jesus, where the light of Jesus will be the only light we need, and where Jesus in all his divinity, glory and authority will not only dwell with Moses and Elijah, but live with all his people for all eternity. What glory. 
What a saviour. What a God. Let's pray. Invite Susan and John to come back up because they'll lead us in worship after we've spent some time just reflecting and praying. But just invite you just to sit in the stillness of that, just to turn your eyes once more to Jesus, transfigured, glorified.